Um, my name is Mark Riley. I'm the co-producer uh, of the session, along with Bob and Ray, uh, who's uh, one of our panelists. I'm going to change the panelists back in, uh, in a moment, but just a couple of uh, formalities and important announcements that uh, we would like to get away first. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Wendy Earl, who has a few words to say, and then we'll Wendy? Grassland. 
however many warehouses of technology we have. <coughs> so I suppose, for me, the proposition would not be, well, it may be we are all composers now, but it's not going to be we are all good composers now. I remember years ago, a friend of mine in the stage was discovered to say, from a class, say, which was called Everyone Can Draw, and he came away saying, it should have been called Not Everyone Can Draw Well. And, uh, you know, that is a fact, that, you know, that is how it works. I mean, I'm painfully aware that 10,000 years ago, some guy in a cave in the south of France could draw a horse out of his own phlegm, probably, better than I now with the best crayons from uh, an art shop, or even an iPad, or whatever the one is that can draw. You know, without any of that, I mean, my horses always sort of sag two-thirds of the way back. And, you know, it's, that is ability and technique. You know, it doesn't matter what you've got, I can't draw a horse. And I think that, that worries, you know, that is something that I find uh, is a big issue for a teacher with the interface with the generation, which many of you are, who have grown up with the assumption of technology, because my generation grew up with the assumption of not having it. And we're sort of playing catch up and having to think, well, what are the big issues here? So I suppose for me, the big issue is that this is a tool. Any tool can be really helpful for things like carrying your work around, but it works both ways. I find it immensely frustrating trying to write something, uh, let's say, experimental in terms of meter, uh, using software, where in 10 seconds I could come visit down on a bit of paper, and I do. Um, but having to set up a page and override all the defaults uh, in, in software in order to make that happen is immensely lengthy. So I think for some things, um, the digital technology is fantastic. In fact, one can email sound to people. I don't understand how that works, but I know, I know that we can. That is extraordinary. But on the other hand, some of these things are incredibly laborious. As you know, if you rely on a, you know, a PowerPoint demonstration to give a talk and it goes down just before you start, and you end up starting 20 minutes late, whereas you know, if you just have a piece of paper and see the digital technology, um, it might work. And the, the, the blurb for the talk says, uh, software tools uh, such as surveillance logic can transform composition. But if that's true, I'm not necessarily sure it's in a good way, because uh, the software, or the one I use, the package, is not a level playing field, it's not a blank piece of paper. It's absolutely loaded with assumptions about the fact that we're going to want to do something commercial with uh, four beats and a bar, and uh, you know, it's going to have a key signature, all these sort of things. They're all in, embedded in this thing. And that's fine for me because I, I can override them. But it presents a student who may be very little experience of developing their own individuality with a set of assumptions that they should not, that they sh should not have presented. They should make those themselves. So I'm very, very chary of that. Um, and I think coupled with that is a set of very sharp elbows that technology often has uh, in the sense of kind of impatience with other modes. So, um, you know, I'm dealing with students wanting to use this, surprised maybe I don't by saying you can use that in a couple of years, but here's a piece of paper, I'll show you how to use it. They're surprised by that because um, obviously their school has taught them that this is what, you know, this is you want to compose, you know, you click here and a notebook here. Um, but, you know, it can also put things in the wrong place. I mean, if you do what I do, you need to know how to design the score and where things go and how much information to put on a page. And all those things software will do for you in the wrong way. And therefore, you do need to kind of uh, override that. And you need to be the designer of your music if you write it down. There are lots of areas of the world to not write. It down and don't write music down and don't, you know, the issues are totally different and I shall defer to the others to say those, uh, to, to investigate those in a minute. There are so many musics and I suppose technology is broadly transferable to all of them, but uh, my end of it is one that is slightly um, dubious, we're still picking and choosing as to what is used to facilitate music. And Beware, and we're very cautious, I am anyway, of uh, making assumptions that we can be better composers because of what is basically a tool. It should belong in the toolkit. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Um, Tom. Oh, 
obviously more trained to play this is. And maybe surprisingly, I agree with everything he's been saying when it comes to technology. Now, I kind of play my cards out. I love technology. I'm a, I bought my first computer in 1987. I've got every piece of software that could possibly have the composition I've got it on my iPhone, I've got it on my iPad, I've got it on my every Disney information. I absolutely love it, and I'm convinced that it really, really helps me to compose music. And that's the problem, because it doesn't. But it does have the ability to convince you that, that, that it's working. I've got a 13 year old son, and he's convinced that he's doing his own work when he's sitting in front of the computer. It's what computers do. I do it that. So we, we all do it. You sit on Facebook, you look at YouTube, and go on work. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as, as an illustration of, of, of what Felix was saying, really, I can just do the, this party trick with happy birthday to you. So I'm going to ask you a question about happy birthday to you, if you could answer it as quickly as possible. How many times does the word you occur in happy birthday to you? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. So Felix got that in roughly a second. It takes you 10 seconds to sing Happy Birthday to you. So what you were doing was running the fast forward in your, in your brain, Happy Birthday to you, 10 times faster than it actually sounds. Now, if you were going to your computer to work that out, you'd have to listen to the song all the way through. It would take you 10 seconds. You would be convinced that that's the best way to do it. Now, when you're working with music software, that's what you inevitably do, because it plays it for you. It plays it for you with beautiful samples these days. I've got the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. I've got every song you could possibly imagine. And it sounds fantastic. I love the sound of an orchestra. I could play one note on the keyboard and listen to the sound of the orchestra, and I could sit there for hours listening to it because it's a beautiful sound. It doesn't help with the process of composition. Uh, composition has always been a low tech, probably the lowest tech area of music making. That, that, that is the ideal piece of technology involved in writing music because you can scribble things down. You can Rub them out, you can do diagrams, you can go all repeat that, you can go back and do all that stuff. You can't do that with the software that exists at the moment. Not to say that there won't be software in the future that allows you to do that, but at the moment, there's nothing around. There's, there's no sign of anything being developed. If you look at what's happened with Sibelius, which is the main um, software for writing music down, or Sibelius is the one, but Sibelius is kind of one. It's been taken over by Adam, it's been acid to strip from the fired everyone. On the research team. So there's no sign of space that's going to develop beyond where it is now. So at this point in time, looking at the te technology we've got, again, I agree with Piers. Logic and surveillance have revolutionized the way that we write music. No, it hasn't. The way we write music is in our heads. It's very, very easy to write music, especially logic. You can sit there, you can drag in with loop, you can drag in with loop, you can write other things. You can make something that sounds fabulous. So it's not something that anyone else is going to want to listen to. And it's this connection between numbers and music goes back to Greek times, it goes back to Pythagoras, it goes back to Plato. And obviously it's fascinating. Obviously you can see mathematical connections between music and numbers, but it only goes so far because music, if I've learned anything in the 40 years I've been doing this, it's that music has to be intuitive. It, it, it's, it's a non-verbal form of communication. If I could describe to you what I think about music, there wouldn't be any point in doing it. There wouldn't be any point in listening to you if you could talk about it. All the interfaces we have at this point in time between the composer and the software are verbally based. They're, they're, they're based in, in very crude graphics that represent a piece of paper. But it's a piece of paper that you can't turn around without a lot of, you know, happening. And you look at what, what digital music has done most successfully. It's done the most boring things successfully. It, it's di digital pianos have now become ubiquitous all over the world. Now, I remember, clearly remember saying in 1975, when I was studying electronic music, I was saying, well, one thing I'll never do is make something that sounds anything like a piano. Well, obviously, I was wrong. So, technology moves on and keeps moving, and where we are at the moment is where we're going to be very clearly at time. But the interesting thing is, is that technology is moving faster than the music at the moment, and that's never happened before. If you go back into the history of music, the way that the piano was developed 
was in order to make the music that was being written the same best. It, it was technology was always following the development of, of the music. And, and the same thing with the electric guitar, that, that people invented electric guitars in 1929 to make Hawaiian black, you know, the original Rick Backer bedpan guitar was, in, was invented to, to make Hawaiian band sound feasible. So, so you can get a guitar. Te technology followed the way the music was developed. The electric blues in, in, in Chicago, you know, Fender and, and all those other com companies jumped on bandwagons that, that were started by musicians. To say that Technology is leading the way in composition, misunderstands the, the process of, of making music and the process of writing music. Uh, it also brings into question the whole thing of what is a composer. Something that I've made, I've got part of my work has you know, so been in, in writing TV, so I don't regard that as my composition work, but it, it's the same process of writing music for, for TV shows. And something I've noticed over the years, I started doing it back in the very early 80s, like and gradually the word composer came into it. I, I, never, I never used to describe myself as a composer in that particular setting. I, I grew up in South Wales. I remember my father being very dismissive of someone said, well, he calls himself a composer, he's only written two auditoriums and not for he's a couple of years to call himself a composer. Uh, but these days, everybody's a composer, because that's the way, that's now a job description. It's a job, job description of putting music together. And it incorporates the job of arranger, the job of musician, because half, half the music that, that these people who are described as TV composers do, they're actually recording the music themselves, they're engineering the music themselves, they're mastering the music themselves. It, it's cutting out six or seven stages of the process of, of, of making music, which are being combined into one job, which is now being described as composer. So under that definition, yes, we can all be composers. Can we compose anything that anyone's got any interest in listening to is really the question. Thank you very much. Previously, we've had computers generating music, 
So learning, being fed lots of information about how a bug or algorithm works, say, and then being able to do a kind of impressive but unmoving <laughs> pastiche of bug. More recent, you know, more recently, what's happened is um, there's a guy called David Cope, who is a music professor, but also a sort of artificial intelligence uh, pioneer in the musical sense, and he developed a program in the '80s which he called Emmy, um, which was this, this machine that could compose and stuff like that. And then when he realised that Emmy, um, Emmy annoyed musical experts because they couldn't tell the difference between uh, Emmy and uh, Bach or other composers who start Emmy learned. But then once Emmy seemed to be um, time to retire, he developed Emmy to another group, which gave a more human name uh, because he was trying to get a record deal. And he called this new group to Emily Howe, um, and it's a sort of virtual successor, virtual daughter of Emmy. Um, and the idea with Emmy Howe is that Emmy Howe can compose in unquote her own style. You can hear there's a couple of Emily Howe records have been released. They're worth investigating. Um, they're not the most moving thing I've ever heard, but they're, they're fun, they're interesting. And they are, the idea that a composer is a computer, is a composer, is, is really fascinating. The Ionis, which is the name of the uh, computer that's written this piece recently that the LSO has been, been performed. So, and that's a landmark piece that comes from the University of Malaga, and that's a landmark piece because it's the first time that a computer or a computer cluster has composed a piece that top notch musicians, in this case, the episode of what the deep worthy performance, is another landmark. And the idea again is that Ionis composes in its own style. You feed in how long you want the composition to be, and you feed in what instruments you'd like to be featured, and then you, you know, click a button, and pretty soon afterwards you get a piece out. So, an extraordinary idea. Um, someone like David Cope would argue that that is no different to uh, the algorithmic sort of process that any composer goes through, or certainly maybe a composer uh, of John Cage who embraces Charles Elvis. Um, it's not quite as simple as that, of course. One of the things that even advocates of this new piece by Ion has, uh, have detected is this, this kind of quality of greyness. So, in the moment of all that, when you sort of step back, you feel somehow that it didn't uh, have enough light and shade. Although, again, it's very difficult to know. It's interesting, that piece was performed um, to mark 100 years um, since Alan's ring, and the, the, the idea of the test to see, who developed not only computers, but also the test, the sort of labor test, of, uh, as I'm sure people know about the definition of when she start to think for themselves. And that was part of the idea that this would function as a sort of blind test of death. <laughs> well, blind test, I guess, to work out if people could tell the difference between a computer composition and one by a human being. Um, so yeah, one problem that I can see in this is this quality of greyness. Uh, another problem is that I don't think you can... Oh, well, another key problem is that you need a person in the first instance to tell the computer what to do and what we as humans think of as music and then the computer um, moves on from there. And plus, absolutely crucial, you need a computer to, uh, uh, sorry, absolutely crucial, you need humans as well to come and perform the thing at the end. So this, if it was simply played by the computer, the IRS wouldn't sound much good, but the reason why it sounds interesting is because the LSO come and played it. Um, so yeah, I think it, work, it works as a, an interesting, uh, the idea of computers generating their own compositions and <coughs> it's very interesting to use that very, but, but it hasn't got to the stage of being moving yet. Thank you.
uh, working out whether I think it has a place either on my record label or in the concert hall that I program, uh, which is a very different set of circumstances from being what all these people do, which is sit down in front of a public screen or a piece of paper and try and come up with uh, new work. And frankly, I'm, I'm in awe of anybody who, who even attempts to do that, um, regardless of what kind of tools and technology they're doing. Um, because uh, I think one of the things that always strikes me when I hear people, uh, in a sense, kind of uh, bemoaning the proliferation of technology and saying, um, oh, it's, it's all so much easier now than it used to be. Um, you know, I challenge those people to actually turn on a computer and look at Logic or Pro Tools and start writing, because it's, it's incredibly difficult. These, these software environments um, offer an unbelievable array of parameters. Um, and they also, uh, uh, you know, offer you lots of kind. Of, uh, you know, it's already been remarked that lots of preconceptions about what you might be about to do, which, if you're trying to be creative, you really don't want that. So, staring at um, uh, a new uh, logic session is just as uh, bewilderingly kind of frightening as um, being a novelist staring at a blank piece of paper in a typewriter. You know, you still have to decide which, which button you're going to press next. Um, uh, and, but having said that, um, I'm, I suppose I echo, of course, the view that what really counts is the ideas, and that's really what I'm saying in that sort of preamble. Um, and so uh, I dispute the idea that uh, anybody uh, can be a composer, because of course you have to have good ideas to be a composer. But on the other hand, I do celebrate um, the democratisation of um, not so much programming or composition environments, but of kind of sound generating uh, tools, uh, software, um, soft, soft, software instruments, um, things like GarageBand, which come kind of preloaded onto all kinds of computers. And the reason I celebrate that is because I suppose, in my kind of naive and idealistic view, um, I think the world is a better place when people are engaging with the process of music making because I think it's just uh, you know uh, an incredibly enriching experience, whether you're any good at it or not, frankly. And I would not ever. Um, uh, say to people, oh, you know, you know, you need to have a certain amount of training or uh, anything before you start to make music. Because I think the urge to make music, to express yourself through music, is one of the most kind of basic and fundamental kind of human uh, traits. And uh, who am I to take that away from anybody, whether they're any good at it or not? Um, but what I do think you have to do, um, in my position as a listener, as somebody who's um, filtering through uh, uh, work that's coming to me, um, often electronically, you know, I mean, not a day goes by without somebody sending me a link to their SoundCloud page and inviting me to assess their output by listening to it there. Um, I think what I have to do and what we all have to do um, as listeners is, uh, is to learn ways of navigating this huge proliferation of activity uh, that, that's been brought into being by the proliferation of technological means of production. Uh, and that means that actually we, uh, collectively, as a, as a kind of uh, community of listeners, need to refine our critical tools. Uh, because the fact that it's become not easier to do but, uh, in terms of great, great work, but easier to do in terms of everybody having the means of production, uh, means that there's just more stuff. And that means we need to find ways of really challenging ourselves uh, to work out what we value. Uh, to work out what we think is uh, is of interest, and to in a way just justify our our decision making process as listeners. I mean, not just I mean, professionally, I make decisions about things that I want to present to the public. But I think all of us now have to make really, and it sounds trivial, but with with so much music out there available at the click of a button, we have to really challenge ourselves and say, why am I devoting my attention to this? I I could spend every waking moment listening to new music, and actually I'll spend several hours a day listening to music I've never heard before. Um, uh, and I have to have a really good set of kind of critical processes which makes me decide whether I want to continue listening to something and make, and make a note of it and say this is of interest, I'll pursue this or I'll bear it in mind. Um, and, uh, or the, the, the alternative decision of just saying well, this isn't happening for me, I'm going to stop. So, so in a sense it just moves the, you know, the gatekeepers of culture that they used to be you know, music publishers or record companies or whatever um, no longer control the admission of work into the into the you know the listenable universe. We we control it ourselves, and so we have to be um, uh, very careful, I think, about what we, we 
we won't spend the hand or waste our time on. Um, and that uh, is a whole new set of circumstances. Um, just also, I've mentioned in passing sort of uh, an anecdote uh, which may be of interest. Um, uh, I, um, I, I'm a contemporary music programmer, which means uh, it doesn't necessarily mean what people think it means. It means that I kind of investigate the whole, you know, the, the, the concepts that I present here. It um, uh, can be anything from very, very purely acoustic, folk, traditional music, world music, local music, jazz, whatever. Um, but it also means that I spend quite a lot of time uh, in this kind of amorphous zone that you might call contemporary um, c composition. I've worked with, you know, I know quite a lot of living composers. Um, and one of the things that interests me about young composers, uh, 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 kind of, I've worked with from time to time, is that they're, uh, a lot of them have unbelievably switched on to, uh, even though they've come, you know, through a very traditional background in, you know, composition training. Uh, they're all incredibly open to technology and using it and working with it, and increasingly, and this is the thing that I find very appealing, they're open to working with musicians that don't come from a classically trained background and finding ways to facilitate them. So what's quite interesting is that I'm seeing a kind of new network of partnerships actually evolving, where you've got people who are conventionally trained composers, but with a kind of interest in technology, and people who are just musicians with great ideas actually coming together to produce work that is a kind of curious hybrid of kind of, uh, as it were, you know, pop composition which doesn't involve writing notes on paper, it just goes with gut or by ear or whatever, or experimentation, and people then formalising that or, or enhancing that with, with classical arrangements or whatever. So, you know, I'm not saying all this work is, is good, but I think it's interesting that there's this kind of new field of kind of uh, hybrid practice sort of slowly, slowly emerging. One of the uh, experiences that brought this home to me recently was I did a concert really quite recently weeks ago with a, uh, 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 you know, echoing this idea that everybody gets called composers now again, I call this guy a composer, although it's questionable whether he is in the traditional sense, but Carl Nicholas Yard, who's a, you know, 24-year-old producer, stroke composer of largely electronic music, although he uses uh, acoustic musicians in his recording process. Uh, and this is one, of, he's one of these absolute classical uh, examples of a kind of new breed of young, effectively bedroom-based, home-based, quote, composer, unquote, people who make really, I think, quite striking and interesting music uh, using, uh, you know, almost entirely electronic environments. Yes. Sorry? All oh, right, okay, sorry. Uh, anyway, he, he was coming into a concert and he said, um, uh, I want to work with a choir, please. And uh, this was about a week before the concert. And I said, oh, right, okay, well, I'm trying to find you a choir. What kind of choir do you want? And he said, oh, just any choir. Uh, and I was like, children? You know, mm -hmm. You know, what, what age, you know, and he basically didn't know. He was so used to just being able to file through lots of pre recorded sounds in his kind of setup and just kind of choose ones that he liked. But when it came to making the kind of decisions that a genuine composer would make, he just didn't know how to go about making them. So we basically had to do it for him. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and one Send it, trust, can you imagine him out of trust in this? And then he gets a record back 
which we'd never heard before, and he'd play it, and we'd all be incredibly excited. And that record would have been recorded in the studio, the British people playing, with essentially things that we now come to call analog recording systems, which I'm sure that other people can explain so I'm mean, far better than I, but the point is not digital. Okay? The way that that information was coded was called analog. And now, when we listen to things, we listen to things digitally, we've got digital radios, we've got all kinds of things, but those people who still care about it go back to vinyl and they say, oh no, there's a difference in the sound, there's a difference in the sound. And that's very interesting to me because this is a whole thing about how we listen to sound and what happens to sound when it's coded differently in different ways because there is something changing and there is something happening. And to go back to the point that Simon made about digital pianos, I work with piano players, I work with them all over the world, and there's a huge difference between listening to somebody play a digital piano and going, like, how could you make the sound? You always to swear to that the sound man there can make their digital piano sound fantastic. But I can tell the difference if I'm listening to Simon play Steinway. Simon's playing a hundred thousand pound worth of beautiful piano in a room. He plays it differently. He plays it, he responds to the sound differently. And guess what? So do we. So do we. And that's really interesting, I think. Because with all of this fabulous stuff, and I love it, I love the things that we do. I love that I can sit in a room in Corby and record everything that we've done. And somebody will say, just get that harmony down, get that harmony down, go to my own phone, and I'll get down the harmony, and I'll stand in different places in the room and send it all out when I get home to all the different songwriters in my songwriting group there. And we can all listen to it. And that's great, it's great, it's great. It's not the same as sitting in the room and listening to it. And it never will be. That's interesting. So what digital things allow us to do is fabulous. But I, I, I have to go, mm, talking about how we might record something. Or oh, well, we, can, we can go into uh, this place and we can sit down and we can put down the drums and then we can put it into a click track. Click track. And what does a click track do exactly? Well, a click track gives you a regular beat, and what it does, it does that so that when you go on to Logic or Pro Tools, you can put down your violin player and line it all up with that stuff. And we go, like, oh, we listen to something, we listen to something that was recorded, trying to think, what was that song? Oh, I know, Everything I Own. You listen to the original version of Everything I Own, and the tempo is all over the shop. They go in the chorus, and then we get so excited that they're in the chorus that the tempo doubles, and then it all gets pulled back when they go back in the verse. And what that effectively does is it gives you a sense of movement in the core of your being, which is to do with the way that rhythm excites you. Do you go, well, what is it when I listen to that dance music and I listen to that dance music? And the difference is that that dance music was all controlled by a drummer, who's imperfect. Because the drummer got a bit excited in the choruses, so it all speeds up. Try running to Tamil Hotel and you'll see exactly what I mean. So we go, oh, we're really slow, you know, it's the same record. Because people got excited, they pulled back, and all of those things have an effect on what is essentially, I think, a human and beautifully human thing, which is music. Let's go to the voice, which is my particular broke bear. So, I've spent my lifetime learning about singing and thinking that I haven't even started. I'm at the top of this iceberg, there's so much I ain't got to, is what singing is and what singing can be. And I listen to things and I thought, nobody sang that. That wasn't sung. What that was was that a producer went into a room, took all the notes and made them, made them near perfect, made them in tune. But if I listen to an old gospel harmony group, if I listen to the Golden Gate, or indeed the backing vocals of the Supremes for the sake of argument, people are singing very slightly out of tune. And those slight out of tunenesses are what make them blend. And they make them blend beautiful. And they make, when you hear now, a lot of backing vocals sound very kind of cloggy and a bit un... un... Un, unmoving, untasty, unsoften. They're not, they're not sung. They're not sung. They've been digitally manipulated by, not in a particularly brilliant way, in my opinion, but that's another thing. Let's go to craft work. Craft work, we're going to talk about composition and 
Mind Electronics, I think really, really did some fantastic work. But why? Because of, and it started right at the beginning, taste. Fantastic taste. Now remember, I'm really lucky because I've been through all of this. I've grown up through all of this. I've grown up through synthesizers, analog to digital, the changes in recording, and it's all fantastic and I love what technology can do. But I've been known and I'm, I'm concerned by what we become, ex, what becomes acceptable to us through digital work. And I think it's really an interesting thing to question that all the time. Because if you come back into a room and listen to people playing, you can hear the difference. So that's why I started with me. I didn't mean to get oh, yeah. that <laughs> Quite laborious from pen and paper because 
If you understand how the brain works, you only 20% of, of, of what you actually goes through your eyes uh, you know, is, is what you see. The rest of it is, is made up of your other senses, so it's tricking me. I don't want my music to be over the top, I want to enhance the experience. And I don't think that can be done by a computer. However, what a computer can do is make my workload a lot quicker if I set my templates up, if I've got things, uh, my workload can be, can be done a lot quicker. It can then go to, to, to Sibelius for me to then sort of work on that and then get it printed. So in that sense, it works, but I don't think it takes over the, the position of Um, yeah, just what you say makes me think that as far as uh, Emily or Emily was confirmed, was that what puzzles me about that is that merit in art, in our case music here today, is kind of, um, I can't think of the word, it's kind of uh, attributed cognitively by us. You know, I mean, you know, my cat doesn't know why you know, one work is better than another work. But in other words, you know, we, we, we come up with a set of criteria which, in fact, none of us fully agree with, which is why, you know, things like marking student work are so difficult, you know, and you just have more benchmarking and all this kind of thing, you know, there's this list of things. That are, but it, you come up with that, and that's a human set of values. And so what I don't understand about the programming of Emmy or the Emily is how you, what you would instill for it to come up with, because I'm sort of becoming increasingly aware that style is something uh, that composed the music sort of an art works in and sort of reacts against. And so you know, it's amazing that Brahms does that because it's, you know, it's outside what one would expect. And I think one of the difficulties with contemporary art music of the sort that people like me write is that there isn't a style now, and therefore people don't own anything to start with, and therefore it's very hard to tell what uh, is eccentric to that. It's a language of eccentricity. Um, and so how the hell do you program a computer to fit in with that? Well, you, know, you can have a style. I could see how you can get a computer to write bad 18th century music, to which I the most are, are eccentric, you know, because they transcend that. But I don't see even how that could be done. That's exactly the reason you say that you know we have to have a set of, sort of human agreed criteria of sort to to encode the mystery. Can I say the love? We've got we. We'll come back to 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 you guys in a minute, and I'll take both people for questions or points. Um, if you could stand up uh, unless you're really shy, uh, you can come up with the top of the. Uh, uh, I'm up now. Um, <laughs> I think there's certainly there's this something which uh, the panel seems to be skirting around, or, or certainly that I feel I'm not hearing because maybe I've, I've been worried about a slightly different discussion. But it, it, it's starting to emerge in the sense of people talking about the authentic and the human and the analog. Uh, and uh, it's as if well, what you point, you're pointing to is that the digital somehow uh, is, is inauthentic and, and, and actually the key word inhuman. But when you, when you think about that, well, let's just I want to follow through a couple of ideas on that because one, one thing has been kind of uh, reaffirmed is that it's always a tool. Technology is a tool, it's a tool, it's a tool. Now, that a tool is an extension of human uh, intention, right? But what's interesting about the place about creativity and digital technology is that actually uh, there's a kind of growing sense that um, we can't, there are things that computers can produce that we can't. I mean, you see it in, for example, the base around uh, iterative architecture, uh, parametric architecture. So when you go around the city of London, you see these buildings that are all wobbly, right? The mathematics required to make those wobbly glass and steel buildings, you know, kind of the kind of the Red Cool House style of architecture. It's based on, it comes from the fact that you know, computers can model uh, structures and spaces that are incredibly impossible for, you know, it's got basically the, the limit of what is possible for a human to, to produce. So there becomes an issue about, well, when the machine produces things, right? Um, do, do we kind of take its creativity as something that we can 
through its very own artistic debate? Or is it so inhuman that it somehow has its own originality? Yeah. I mean, I was, I, was just, um, I was just looking at YouTube while I was listening. Because it strikes me that um, you know, this issue goes, you know, goes back into uh, pop culture and pop music for, you know, for, for decades. I uh, was looking for the... What we apply to that in terms of our aesthetic 
is a different point. But in, in, in that we can do it, in that we're expanding on that, I think that's a really positive thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of very happily engaged with lots of new music that doesn't um, use conventional composition methods or, or, or um, musical instruments. Um, you mentioned Rio Jauhead, I've presented him here a couple of times, and I personally think he's a genius, and he's absolutely working with what, what you would probably, what a 19th century listener would certainly describe as non-musical sounds, but he creates an immense sort of sensuality out of very, very distorted, internal, uh, you know, totally non-human, not a non-acoustic source material, and constructs it in such a way that it has an unbelievably, to me, exhilarating effect. Um, and I think what's interesting about his work, uh, what, what's interesting about this idea that we respond to things which aren't human is absolutely true, um, and we can respond in very different ways. So, for example, Bob mentioned, or at least alluded to, auto-tune, this idea that producers can uh, make um, uh, vocal performance is artificially perfect by, by, by playing around with auto tune, which is of course true. Uh, and some people actually just really love that as a sound. And one of the things that, um, that has really struck me is that, for example, in, in North African music, where a lot of vocal um, uh, work is a work based around melisma, the idea that you kind of you know, wobble around a note, lots of kind of producers of the 21st century kind of Ryan and Shelby music of North African kind of vernacular folk forms. They've actually taken to auto tune with like total glee because you can do totally human levels of melisma. You can you can melismate, you know, do your heart's content forever in auto tune, and and it's so they, they've created this sort of cybernetic versions of their uh, folk music, and folk music, which which to my ears is both kind of authentic because it's rooted in a community and a tradition, but also like, amazingly and excitingly and thrillingly inauthentic because it's got this huge kind of computer stuff welded onto it. When I was talking about the uh, talk to Marcus about this, what seems like a like disillusionment with uh, with electronic music, you know, do you think that so the the African musicians do you talk about? Cause I've seen something like that. Don't have that kind of jaded. It's all been done before kind of thing. So you know, we, we, what what we see is possible as a element. I just think it's I think it's all about context, and I think one of the things that's really interesting is that is that. This, this, this genre fragmentation that's going on means that in any kind of micro genre of electronic music making, um, the, pe the only people who can really kind of judge it in a way are people who are completely immersed in that genre. So I've just spent two or three days in Poland at this festival called Unsound, I literally got back last night, um, which is a, a festival of, of kind of, you know, for want of a better phrase, underground electronic stroke experimental music. And there's a huge debate, you know, there's, you, can, you can move around a room where they have this kind of, you know, three rooms in a venue, you can go to, to tiny micro variations on kind of different kinds of bass music or different kinds of hypnagogic electronic music or whatever. And, and to the uninitiated listener, uh, it probably all sounds exactly the same, but to, to people who are really, really engaged, they're both hugely excited and kind of animated by discussions about, you know, which of these little kind of things are taking the music forward or making progress or whatever, and it's a, it's a very lively human, you know, contextual discussion, which, which many people are really excited and engaged by. Simon, did you want to... Well, I just wanted to say, um, can we just clarify that, that we're not talking about electronic music, we're talking about digital composition here, yeah. and, and there, there is a difference between the digital approach and the, and the analog approach. And when you're talking about new sounds and all the rest of it, digital isn't the only way to go. There's it, it, a huge area. Uh, the other thing is that we're talking about digital composition. If you're talking about digital performance, that's something else again. The, the, there's a huge, massive things we can do performing music using di digital, digital te technology. But this discussion was focusing on, on, on the composing side, not on the realisation of that composition. And, and, and I just don't want to come over as, as a light. You know, the, 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 in terms of making new sounds, I think digital technology is fantastic and, and, and is, is an incredible source. Of course, the, the, you know, what, what is a composer is really what, what, what this discussion will end up being about. You know, who, what's a musician, what's a composer? The, the negative being what I said before, that we're, we're cutting people out of the chain. We're, we're, we're combining composer and musician very often, and, and so it, it does get confused. But, yeah, so I was going to say a big distinction whether you're writing your, yeah, whether you're writing music for a human performer, as in fact I am, but, uh, or whether you're writing 
whether you're using technology, the technology to produce the sounds. I mean, that's a completely different. How about the human being is, is then manipulating the sound in the performance? Uh, well, yes, but if then yeah, but there's intervention on that beforehand as well. And, you know, I'm sure it's in the beginning then, but, yeah, you'll have that yeah. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Uh, well, I think the gentleman's point really is, is the key one, which is to do with, uh, it seems to me quite odd that, I mean, very briefly, Piers was saying, how do you make a computer that can, uh, you know, compose music like this, and I am certainly not coming from a background in artificial intelligence, but as I understand it, you feed in, in the case of uh, Ionis, I think, it, uh, and Emily Howe as well, is going, I know Emily Howe basically fed in, I think 20 key composers right from Palestrina up to himself, David Crow for the 21st century. Enormous amount of music which the computer then breaks down and analyzes. I don't understand how. And he's supposed to from that to be able to come up with a new style. That's the idea. But it's, the idea. it's based on a combination of kind of music, like a musical genome. I think people in the audience might know more than me uh, about that. But that's basically how it works. Um, right. <laughs> but I think yeah, the key thing is. is Yes, it, but the key question is really, rather than trying to get a computer that replicates something that the human would do, why don't we use computers to try and do something that we can't do ourselves? That seems to me the most interesting, apart from the thing that everyone's really using the tools to do this or that. In terms of actually composing new music, can it be truly new rather than just something that maybe it happens to a Uh, first, just a quick comment to Piers. Actually, animals do differentiate between different kinds of music. Some interesting studies on rats who seem to like Mozart very much, actually. They use a hinged floor and they see which side the rats go to. They, would, they play different music on the two sides of the floor. Mozart's popular, pop music is not so. Well, I see. Mike's actively remarking for you. I'd like to make two points, really. The first one is. Uh, I'm a traditional musician coming from a, an old-fashioned background and uh, I kind of always feel the urge to try to get into the modern technology of music making but I feel completely over... I mean, I'm not talking about things like Sibelius, which seems to me means to an end. I'm talking about actually creating sounds and music uh, with, with, say, synthesizers and so on. And first of all, I feel completely overwhelmed by this. It's like I've... I've, 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 I've I've learned a lot about music, I play music, now I've got a whole new feel. And it's like beginning right from the start again. It's a bit overwhelming, so I kind of shy back from that. The thing that worries me is that I know as a pianist, the important thing is to get your technique out of the way. You don't want to be thinking about what you're doing when you play, you want to get into the feeling of it. And what worries me here, if, you, if technology is so complex, if technology is so complex, I, I'm aware of that, I mean, I've recently played with a rock band, and I had this synthesizer, wonderful, different kinds of sounds, and I get so fascinated by all these sounds, that I forget I'm not really playing anymore, I'm not feeling it. That was the, the dominance of technology over the feeling of music worries me, when you bring in this highly complex array, which I, I can see the potential. That's the first point. The second point, yeah, I want to take up Chris's point, which is we need to have our own taste. Now the problem with taste, of course, is very strongly influenced by what we hear ourselves. And the fact that we have more and more electronic music out there, or digitally created music, which is not of the kind of dark likes, it has that kind of uh, patterned technology sound, I wonder if that's not influencing our taste in music. And uh, I wonder about composers, I mean, I'm not very up in this area, but I, I, people like Steve Wright, who I like, uh, Philip Glass, they seem to have a mechanical quality, a repetitive quality, which may well come from this dominant sort of thing. But maybe it's that, and then I think we probably have to kind of be a sort of composer. I see some actually very, very interesting parallels between what we've just discussed here with the digital creativity and the composing side, but the area that I'm in, which is actually 3D and modeling. 
Um, I run a software company, so I deal with the programmers who actually model our software. And one of, I think what has actually made me a very important part of what we are actually doing in software is that um, I am a designer maker, I'm not a programmer. I tell my programmers what we need. I don't let them dictate what they think we need as designer makers to be able to do 3D modeling digitally. Um, and I think that the, the, the parallel I see with some of the programs that you use is with computer-aided design, which is very, very prescriptive. And it doesn't allow for human things like serendipity. And that is what we've actually built into our software as a default. Because I think it's so important that we can actually use um, a lot of our sensibilities to decide when we do something and when we stop, when we play, when we experiment. Uh, and although a lot of people say that our software is maybe simplistic, I think it's because it gives so much scope. You know, like you say with the pencil and paper, it just gives you so much more scope for that what if, that sort of serendipity side. I'm really enjoying this discussion. So Mike, we've only got 18 minutes left, so uh, I think we should have a you know, less bit of a thing on the end. Uh, well, if you want to just want to think about it. Yeah, it's not that I think that everything we do, but I don't know if I've given that impression that I don't want to. Um, I, I don't think that everything human is better. Um, I think it's really an interesting way to look at composition when you look at what digital things can throw up. I think that there is good things uh, which are compositional in contemplation are a really interesting thing. But I think you've got to also look at what the effect is of listening to that. Building in serendipity I find fascinating. I, I'd like to start with that. Where would you even begin to do that? And how can you program? It's a really good point, Mark, as well. Is, you know, and, and the, the, how can you program in style? How do you, how do you account for the things that we can't possibly account for? And, um, and so I'll go back to a little simple thing, which is the microphone. When the microphone came in, it changed the way that people sang. People could sing in a completely different way because of the microphone. And there were all kinds of people who assumed that operatic music has taken a very long time to come to the use of the microphone. And the microphone now can do so many things. And so you'll see somebody, I wish I a very good look, like Katie Tunstall going on to, uh, uh, on to George Holland and using all of, that, uh, all, uh, all of that technology to make her voice do various things. We can do all kinds of things with the microphone that are marvellous, absolutely marvellous. So there are, there are ways that we adapt to and use things. But right at the root of that is the things that are magical, and the things that are magical in music are magical precisely because they're indefinable, and they're indefinable on the side of everything we discuss, and they come from a place that, thank the Lord, we can't nail down, and we can't tip it up and stand on it another way. It's a, and, and when we can do that, I probably won't want to do it anymore. That's where I'm going with my son. Well, yeah, I suppose people might say so. I think it's the idea of the taste that came up earlier is very important. I think ultimately music, obviously, part of our definition for music, which uh, we might not have thought of previously, has been part of our definition of music, but after conversations like this, you realise part of it is. It's for human enjoyment. Maybe uh, you know, computers themselves can make great music for other computers, but at the moment, it's whatever they do. It's ultimately for, for humans to enjoy. Um, and go back to this uh, title question: Can we all be composers now? Personally, uh, I haven't heard anything from the computer programs I mentioned that rivals the material composed by humans. Um, so. In my case, no, <laughs> I'm not a composer. I certainly can't work with a computer or a living, uh, a living composer. Either. My only thought is the only 
really thing I'm interested in is what happens next. You know, the, 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 and I think there's huge areas of digital music that, that, that are going to get great. And I think musicians have to find new collaborations. They have to find, we haven't got our copies now, we haven't got the same connections that we used to have. Everyone's their own mastering engineer, etc. Et so we need to find new collaborations. And those collaborations inevitably are going to be with people in the digital realm. They're going to be with programmers and designers. And something will come out of it, I hope. That's what I'm looking forward to. I guess what I'd say is that um, I mean I think we are, are seeing a uh, an inevitable redefinition of what it means to be a composer, um, and I think that is being brought about by uh, by how easy it is for people to make music um, now. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that, uh, that it's any good. Um, you know, go back to what I said before is that I just think it behoves all of us as listeners now to have a, a much more kind of not necessarily defined, but kind of alert critical sensibility, um, because it's easy to be surprised and exhilarated by new sounds um, uh, uh, without really, uh, but, but then perhaps you know treating them as being more significant than they are. There's not a kind of underlying uh, aesthetic that you're really uh, of the kind that you should be valuing. Valuing, so it's not. Yeah, just to echo the last two gents, um, just this discussion sort of reminds me that you know all art is humanly received, and that I mean my probably very traditional view of what a composer does is to what includes playing games with the assumptions of the listener, who that composer doesn't know, but you know confounding expectations. Um, taking us to a place that we might not have known before. I mean, unquestionably, technology has a role in opening up those places, but in the end, my construction of it is as a, um, a kind of human social interaction, and therefore, I, there are some aspects of that that I would find hard to digitize. Thank you very much. Can we, can we thank our speakers and thank you.